So last week we started off talking about justification and uh, we talked, I actually kind of broke down the, the chapter, chapter 5 is what we were talking out of and I broke it down into two main points. Roman numeral 1 was the blessings of our justification and then Roman numeral 2 was, was the basis of our justification. I don't really expect you to remember all that, that's why I'm just kind of quickly saying. We had covered verses 1 through 4, let me just read that again because we didn't really finish where we were. So Romans 5, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation, now this is the part that we didn't really finish, Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So we talked about, once again, that the chapter itself is broken down in the blessings of our justification and then the basis of our justification. We'll get into that a little bit this afternoon. Well, this afternoon, this morning. I don't plan on keeping you that long. But uh, whenever, whenever we were talking about, talking about where we were starting off in the blessings... I kind of gave a little bit of an outline of where we were from that point moving forward or from the beginning to the point where we were. We talked about the fact that all men were considered guilty by God. Paul makes that uh, point that all men, both Jew and Gentile, are guilty before God. But he introduces it that way so that he can now expound on or introduce us to how the, the problem is fixed, if you will. Amen. And so I always used to say this a long time ago. I used to say, you know, the word gospel means good news. But before we get to the good news, there's some bad news first. The plan of redemption began because of the fall of man, right? And so we talked about the fact that both Jew and Gentile were guilty, but that God pr provided his righteousness. We, we said in Romans 3.21, now the righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed. See, God revealed through the law to some extent his righteousness. It's important that I say that to you now because there's a scripture that we're going to cover this morning that sometimes it's a little bit difficult to understand. You know, I also wanted to say this, that sometimes, you know, we all like the way that different people operate and their gifts are sometimes are different. This has kind of been on my heart a little bit lately. Sometimes people like real, you know, people that preach real hard. Sometimes people like teachers. God's kind of made me a little bit of a mixture of both. And sometimes, you know, everybody has like a style that they, that they like, but God's called me to teach and to expound and to dig and to dissect and to kind of show it like that. And, and, you know, uh, that's, that's what he's called me to do. And, you know, I don't apologize for the way he called me to do it. Sometimes I apologize for the way it comes out if my personality gets in the way. But um, we're going to be digging a little bit this morning is the point that I'm trying to make. And we're going to dissect some stuff. And so I hope that you're good with that because that's what you got. <laughs> that's what God called me to do. And that's what we're going to do. Amen. All right. So uh, so he gave his righteousness. God. So in the, in the Old Testament, God revealed his righteousness through the law. He gave a written manuscript that said, this is what I expect from you. Now you understand part of my character. Now you understand partly what I'm expecting from you, right? But now in the New Testament, the revelation is God, apart from the law. God's righteousness apart from the law has been revealed. Now God's revealing his righteousness at a whole other level. Now the righteousness of God has taken on itself in bodily form, in the person of Jesus. Amen. And so now Paul goes from there to explain how righteousness first came. But then now the next step Paul does is very methodical. The Holy Spirit through Paul, very methodical in the way that he's presenting this case to explain to us how this whole righteousness thing works. All right. And at the end of today's message, I'm going to explain to you how that even applies to you today. All right. So the, so he explained. And he, but how is he going to get the righteousness of Jesus, the righteousness of God, which is manifest in Jesus over to mankind? Well, then he explained in Romans 4 how two examples of justification and how it was Abraham and David. You remember that? We, used, we even talked about the words reckoned and imputed and that they were actually the same in the Greek. If you'll remember, it means to put into the account of. Abraham had righteousness placed into his account based on faith. And we talked about what the object of his faith was. Essentially, it was Jesus and the sacrifice. We're not going to go back there this morning. And then David said, blessed is the man to whom God does not put guilt into his account. 
David's faith was in the same thing also. He believed that Messiah was coming and he also believed in the blood because he said, purge me with hyssop. And we connected that to the Passover and the shedding of blood and all, and all of that. All right. Then we got into to Romans 5 and we talked about the blessings of God. Blessing number one was that we have peace with God. We talked about the fact that beforehand, and it's important that we understand this, that mankind before Jesus is at enmity with God. The word is spelled E-N-M-I-T-Y, enmity. It's kind of like an enemy. It sounds like that, and that's kind of what it means. It means to be at war with God or that there's a hostility that's taking place between man and God. Now, it's important that you and I understand that because that's the whole premise on why God would have to send his son Jesus to die on the cross to begin with because sin has caused hostility between man and God. It's important that we understand this because as we move further and or closer and closer to the end, we're going to see more and more false doctrine that's going to creep into the modern church. The Bible already told us that was going to happen. The Spirit expressly says that in the end days, people will depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there's going to be a movement that we're going to see more and more where the modern church is going to move away from the truth on, on a more rampant basis. And the sad thing is this, is that people are still going to be saying the name of Jesus. Paul warned it in the book of Corinthians chapter 11. He said that, that they're going to preach a Jesus. It's going to have a spirit connected to it, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the same Jesus. And it's a completely different gospel. And people are going to bear with it. And the reason that they're going to bear with it is it's going to make them feel good. It's going to give them something that they want to hear. And it's going to be pleasing to them. And because there's a spirit connected to it, it's going to feel right. But it's not right. Now, not everybody wants to hear all that, okay? The, the majority of people don't want to hear all that. They want to say, fix me now, preacher. Give me a formula that I can go step one, two, and three, and then tomorrow I'll wake up and everything's better. This ain't the way it works, folks. The way that it works, listen, we can talk. It's a good thing to talk about your problems with people that you can trust. There's nothing wrong with talking about the things that are going on in your heart with people that you can trust. You got to be careful who you talk to about that. Because, <laughs> I mean, sometimes some people broadcast some stuff on the street. You got to be careful. I'm just saying. But ultimately, even though you talk about the things that are going on, because sometimes it could be things that go way back. Even though you realize those things are there and you talk about them, none of that. Even if you talk to a psychologist, even if you lay on his couch, even if he prescribes you a medication, even if he does to you what the one that I used to go see when I was a little boy that had trouble, says, you know, now, now think that you're on a beach somewhere, man. And the warm breeze is blowing over your face. The sand is between your toes. Do you feel yourself relaxing? And then, and then, you know, then he would say things. I, I got to admit, you know, Cynthia, I've already shared this before, but, you know, me and my sister didn't get along that great when we were young. But, you know, I kind of knew. It's kind of like I knew things. Like, I was, I'm not saying I was smart, but I was perceptive, all right? And because I don't think of myself as smart. But I did kind of know what was going on, and I like to mess with people. Even at 12, 13 years old, I like to mess with people. And I remember one time the psychiatrist, the psychologist put these little electrodes on my head. It was supposed to measure your stress some kind of way. And so it, it was supposed to measure your stress. And so he's, he's kind of like, okay, we're going to get to the root of this problem. And so... So what is it that bothers you? So he starts asking me all these questions. And so when he got to my sister, I was like, oh, yeah. this is." And I kind of like made it happen. You know what I'm saying? I made my blood pressure go up. And I was pre premeditatively thinking that, you know, I'm going to do this. And so why did I even say that? I guess I'm just trying to say this, is that we all got things that are going on in our lives. And sometimes they're deep-seated and they're deep-rooted. And there's not anything wrong with talking about it with someone else, talking about it with a friend, talking about someone that you can trust. But at the same time, we have to remember that the answer to the problem is not the psychologist on the couch. It's not the medication that they're going to prescribe you. It's not visual imagery. And I've seen preachers try to do that before in church services and call them out on it. Dude, you were practicing visual imagery, which is a psychological technique. We're not really supposed to do that. But instead, it's to learn where we're to place our faith in order to receive access to grace so that the Holy Spirit, like a medicine for your soul, Amen. can begin to bring healing to you. Amen? And so that's what peace with God is. Amen? We were at enmity with God. The world's at enmity with God, at hostility with God. That's one of the blessings of our justification that Jesus made peace. Amen? Hallelujah. It means to, be, to bind together something that was separated. He made peace 
through his cross. He brought reconciliation. Amen. Uh, number two was that we had access to God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, but we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You know, I've said this many times and even recently, but I, but I think that it's important to, to constantly remind you that whenever you see grace, I think you should see it this way, that it's something that's being, imagine a soap dispenser on a wall. And inside this dispenser is the soap that you need in order to cleanse your hands. Well, the soap is the agent, grace, that's going to do the cleansing. The dispenser is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dispenses grace into our lives. Now, he does, he does the work that Jesus paid to allow it to happen. If there wasn't a company that was manufacturing soap or grace, just saying, then there wouldn't be nothing in the dispenser. But because of what Jesus did at the cross, now you have access to that. And the Holy Spirit dispenses it for your benefit as you need it for whatever it is that you're going through. So the point is, is that if you've got something that you're going through today, you need grace in your life. The Holy Spirit, amen, will dispense it into your life. You need peace. He has peace. You need healing. He has healing. You need uh, help over whatever. He has what it is that you need. You have access to God. That was number two. Remember, there was a veil that separated man from the presence of God. But when Jesus died, that veil was ripped in two. There was a wall that separated the Gentiles from the presence. But Jesus broke down that barrier and made two men into one. Amen. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's one in Christ. We talked about, I used a little box illustration. I drew it on the board. You know, the believer puts his faith in the sacrifice that opens the door of grace. And grace is poured back into the believer. Amen. So I just wanted you to, to be reminded that you have access to grace this morning. Now, where we kind of ended, where we didn't get to, was the third blessing of justification, which is Christian character. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. It says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulations works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Now, I, I'm not trying to cause confusion. Really, what I'm trying to do right here is bring clarity. This word experience <clears throat> would be easier to understand if we gave it the, the word of what it really means to what we would, would be able to understand it better. This is an old King James word that's kind of like a little bit outdated for how we would use it, but when it was written, when the King James Version was written, this is the meaning of the character. Okay, so, so the idea is, is that tribulation brings you to a place of, for patience. Okay, uh, and maybe, maybe we should also do that. The word patience right there would be better, at least for our purposes in our modern English, to understand it as perseverance. And that way, at least we're all on the same page, okay? And so the tribulation provides an atmosphere for perseverance, and perseverance ultimately produces Christian character. So there's a, a process that's taking place. Tribulation is inserted into the life. This may be a poor analogy, but sometimes I talk to people at work, you know, and I'm talking to people that don't understand levels of the gospel like you do. And I was trying to explain to somebody whether it be trials or grace being dispensed into the situation. If you've never seen this movie, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But in the Hunger Games, if you ever saw that movie, the Hunger Games, I was talking to this young girl that just kind of started working with us. Uh, you know, she's been there a little while. And I was trying to explain to her about trials and tricks. She always always, she likes Rebecca from Sunny Brook Farm. Not that I even know who that is, but I'm under the impression like Pollyanna. Everything's just lovely and hunky-dory, you know, and no matter what. I'm like, well, you know, sometimes you're, you're kind of like, you got to have some balance because not everything is good. You know, not, not, in other words, it's not always the, I mean, I appreciate the fact that you got a positive attitude, but, but it's not always, you know, you got to be in reality here, okay? And I was trying to say that sometimes God allows trials and tribulations in our life. And if you ever saw the Hunger Games, you would, you, this is a good little analogy. If you, I guess I got to set it up a little bit, but, um, you know, they would put these kids in this environment where they had to combat one another. 
Okay. Well, they had people behind the scenes that were controlling things. So they had them in an environment they, they had control over. And then the next thing you know, whenever somebody was going maybe too far out of the boundaries where they wanted them, they started a fire. Well, there's a trial that was inserted into the situation. I'm using this loosely as an illustration. Or, you know, somebody was running too far where they, they created some kind of dog digital dogs showed up and chased them back to where they were supposed to be. And so these are trials that are being inserted into this little microcosm, which you could call of, of life, if you will. And God allows trials to be inserted into the midst of our lives in order for them to produce an intended effect, right? At the same time, there was one situation where the girl got burned by the fire. She's up in a tree and she's in a whole lot of pain. Well, all of a sudden come floating on a parachute is this little can of healing sack. That she was able to apply on her. See, that's like grace being dispensed. So there's a trial that's placed into the scenario. Okay, and then I'm not saying that these people thought this whenever they wrote the, the movie. I'm trying to see what I see there and turn it into an illustration. So, but, but God provides the balm of Gilead. Amen. The, Jesus, the, the healing. And so that's really what grace is about too. What I said it once, I'm going to say it again. Healing for your soul. So you find ourselves, we find ourselves in a tribulation. And what ends up happening is, is that it provides an opportunity for perseverance. And the mixture of perseverance with the grace of God results in character development. Another poor analogy probably, but resistance training is the whole point to what people are trying to do whenever they're building muscle. Resistance to the muscle provides hypertrophy or enlargement of the muscle. Resistance in the midst of perseverance, in the midst of tribulation, when you persevere, Produces with the grace of God character in the life of the believer. Now, I just wanted to share with you because sometimes people don't want to persevere. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 13. I always love this scripture. Some people that read it might not love it. If it speaks to you, you won't love it. But then again, maybe you will because it'd be like healing ointment for your soul. But pro so we're talking about persevering instead of running, really. And so I love the scripture. I used to read it. I was like, this is hilarious. The slothful, slothful man says there is a lion without I shall be slain in the streets. And, you know, the way that I always read this particular scripture was like, no, man, there ain't no lion in the street. You're coming up with another excuse, another reason. Why, like, if you just want to come up with an excuse, just turn over and go back to sleep. That's what you are. He's coming up with an excuse or a reason why he can't do what it is that he is supposed to do. No, there's not a line in the street. You know, uh, if you want to look for an excuse, like I said, just turn over. But but instead, quit looking for ways or excuses to not do what God is calling you to do whenever you're supposed to trust God in the midst of tribulations. There's not a line out there, but there are tribulations out there. <clears throat> and there's going to be tribulations each and every day, right? But once again, you know, the tribulation produces something. And when it says that Paul gloried in tribulations, he didn't glory because of the tribulations themselves. You know, oh, yippee, here my heart's broken, here I'm feeling pain. Oh, yeah, you know, I love this way this feels. No, he didn't glory in the tribulation itself. He gloried in the beneficial effect of, that the tribulation was going to produce in his Christian life. Mm -hmm. See, when you're going in the when you're in the valley, you can't. A lot of times, you can't see nothing except the walls around you. But that's why you got to look up. You got to look up at the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, so the word for tribulation means to be pressed. And now I've said this a million times, and I'm sure you've heard it at least once. I love this analogy because this is straight out of the Bible. And this was nugget, boy. The first time I first time I read this, man, this was a nugget. I was jumping up and down, so excited. The word Gethsemane means olive press. Jesus was pressed in the press. See, he was on the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane means olive press. So it was an olive press that was on the Mount of Olives. Jesus was being pressed in the press, and what came out of him? Well, I'm just saying, he sweat blood. His blood, pure blood, sin, sinless blood, atoning blood. Love blood came out of him. Whenever you're pressed, what's in you comes out of you. It's like a stress or a pressure that's applied to a circumstance in a situation. If there's bitterness, gossip, hatred, envy, jealousy, malice, which means want to do harm. 
You can pretend to be, we can pretend to be as godly as we want, but the truth be told, these are evidences that there are things in our heart that are not pleasing with the Lord. And the innate instinct, what's already ingrained on the inside of you, whenever to react to trials or pressure is, is called fight or flight. God put that in us. Psychologists talk about this. I'm not about psychology, but there's some things that are true. A fight or flight response. This goes back to the day whenever mankind had to hunt for a living with a stick. You face a situation and you're either going to stand and fight or you're going to flee the situation. Now, sometimes it's a good thing to flee. It's not always bad to flee. It's, it's a survival instinct. And sometimes it's the right thing to do to fight. Spiritually speaking, same thing. Sometimes God would have you to move away from the circumstance. Sometimes God would have you to stand and endure, right? But once again, uh, the word for patience in the Greek, we're talking about standing. We're talking about staying. And I've written this many times before, and I just love this. I learned this from Brother Larson, and it just stuck out to me so long ago. I've talked to you before how in the Greek, these words are compound, and they're built upon one another. So this is really one word, and I'm just separating it for a purpose. Hupomone. And this word here means under, and this word here means remain. So really the word for patience or perseverance is to remain under the trial. That's when you would stand in the face of. So when you're facing a circumstance, instead of being like the guy who says, oh, there's a lion in the street, I'm not going to go out there and face the day. Whenever you persevere, what you do is you remain under the trial in a God-honoring way. God-honoring way meaning you can still show up and go, like for instance, if I'm having a problem at work, I could still show up at work, but I got a stinking rotten attitude. See what I'm saying? I'm just using that as an example. I'm not happy with the way they're treating me. I'm not happy with my co-workers. Oh, I'm going to go, I ain't no lying in the street, and even if there is, they ain't keeping me from the job today. And then I show up, but yet my attitude's all raunchy. I, I, I destroy productivity because now everything's just falling apart because of my attitude, right? Um, and so I'm not, I may be remaining <laughs> but I'm not doing it in a God honoring way. I can't give glory to God through my life in this circumstance because I'm basically acting worse than a heathen in the world. And then I was talking about Jesus. I've told you all about that before. There's been times in my life where the Lord's like, why don't you just lay off on telling people that you know me for a while? Because <laughs> I'd be bad. You're not doing me a favor right now. I'd be better off if you just kind of zipped your lip. And uh, hey, you know, like, don't be going around doing all your witnessing right now because you ain't acting. All right. And so I just wanted to, to make you aware to under remain, but it's to do it in a, in a God honoring way. And it doesn't matter. Look, God will reveal things and character flaws to our life. That's part of the process of life. That's part of the process of Christianity. He reveals to us true Christianity. You know, that's why a lot of times people don't want to hear the truth because it's like, preacher, I feel like you're poking me in the eye. I feel like you're talking straight to me. Hey, I'm talking to myself, poking myself in the eye. That's why it's red all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, look, <clears throat> there's things in our lives uh, that God wants to reveal to us. But once we realize they're there, we can't personally change that. That goes back to the whole grace thing. And, and you know what? It's pretty common that we know people that fly, flee situations. In other words, people like this, that when they're faced with something stressful, instead of facing and enduring, they run. They run to a new relationship. They run to a new job. They run to a different church or they just run and hide. They might come back later, but they run. They have a habit of running. I'm not trying to say that it's never God's will for you to go find another church. That's not what I'm trying to get at. I don't want to be a control freak. I don't. I don't want to try to make people feel guilty. I got people come over here sometimes and they visit. And I hope you're watching. They come over here and they'll visit. And the whole time what they're saying is, is I feel like I'm doing something wrong. Dude, what you doing wrong? You coming here to the word of God. I ain't trying to get nobody from no other church to come over here. If somebody wants to hear, I'm not trying. I don't want somebody else's. I, I want the people that God wants to send here. But at the same time, if people are starving in a barren land and they're not, being, they're not the preacher's people, you're not my people. I'm an under shepherd Amen. called by God. He's the great shepherd. He gave his life. Amen. And so our purpose is supposed to 
uh, feed the sheep. Wanted to get off on that. I'm just saying that a lot of times, though, that's not the case. People just run. I don't like what he said. I'm going to find another church. And that's what the scripture just said. They will heap for themselves. Preachers. Piles of preachers. Why? Because they have itchy ears. They want to hear a pleasant word. That's what that breakdown in the Greek. Itchy ears. They want, they want to hear a pleasant word. They want something that's going to make them feel good about themselves. The gospel will make you feel good about yourself. Or at least make you feel good about what the Lord has planned for your life whenever you begin to know it and, and submit to it, right? The problem, though, with running is that it's not enduring. And when you take the endurance out of the equation, then you lose the final intended result. When you take a piece out of the equation, you lose the, the final intended result is an approved a, an approvedness, a tried character, a proof, a specimen of tried worth. I've used this example because I've taught this concept many times before of something called the dokimai. That's what the word is in the Greek. And during the time frame of Jesus, coin changers or people that exchanged money, okay, or, or you know, they would do an exchange of, of, of various types of currencies, um, a good one was called a dokimai. It was somebody that you could trust. Because I talked about this before, and I know it's a poor analogy, but they would do this thing called coin clipping where they would take chunks of, off the edges because they would use precious metals in those days to make the coins. You're not going to make any money off of clipping little pieces of nickel off, but back in the day, if they used gold or silver, they would do... It's kind of like, this is a bad illustration for church purposes, but some of you may understand what I'm saying. Drug dealers will cut their drugs. They'll take... If they have a big old, a big old pound of something, they'll take a fourth of a pound. I don't know, maybe not that much. I'm just using that as an example. Fourth of a pound, scoot that off to the side, take a fourth of a pound of something else, stick it in there, mix it all together. Now they just they just increase their profit. See what I'm saying? So the coin clip, so the, the, the bad currency exchanger would clip the coins just a little bit at a time. Then he'd save up enough shavings to where he can melt it down and make a little bit on the side. Well, you're ripping the people off. After the coin's been clipped so many times, it's sent down the line, then it loses its value, right? So people that did the right thing, had good character, had been proven through the trial, were called a dokimai. They were ones that could be trusted, currency exchangers that could be trusted because they didn't clip their coins. You knew that you were getting what you were supposed to be getting from them. And this is the whole point to this character Point number three that we're talking about regarding blessings of our justification, that we have access to grace. And in the midst of the trial situation, right, we are going where the pressure is being applied to our lives. But instead of just running, because listen, you can run to another church, you can run to another job, you can run to another relationship. But if you really love the Lord, he's not going to be done with you. He is committed to developing your character. Amen. And so you're going to keep facing the same circumstance, the same situation time and again. It's going to keep on happening. Whereas if you if we would stay under the trial in a God honoring way, we begin to learn. We begin to gain the wisdom of God, the understanding of God. Right here. Here's a scripture. First Peter one seven. It says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the way that you, that you put gold to the test is you put it under the fire. And when it's melted, the impurities rise to the top. And whenever God allows trial and tribulation to be inserted into our circumstances, it allows impurities to rise to the top. And it allows the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do the work that needs to be done. All right. So now we're transitioning into the next part, which is Roman numeral two, the basis of our justification. Now, I just really picked some of the nuggets out of this because we can this series could last forever. Um, and I do want to get into Romans six and seven before we finish. Not today, but the series, um, the basis of our justification. And so there's a transition that takes place from 
Paul explains to us on the front end, these are the blessings. This is what you have access to now because you have peace with God, you have access to God, and you have the development of Christian character because the grace in the midst of your trial and tribulation is going to produce something in you that God wants to produce in you. Now, this is the basis of it. This is, this is how the foundation of how God is able to give us that standing or that declaration of justification, if that makes sense. Once again, what is the, even the word justification? What does it mean? It's a declaration that you're righteous. See, whenever you died, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, when you died, that's right. Whenever you died in Christ is whenever you got saved. You might not have known this whenever you, whenever you first got saved. But let me just say this. When you were born like Adam, and it's important that we understand this, you were born guilty. You were born guilty, you were born broken, you were in enmity with God, there was hostility between you and God, but God sent Jesus. He took the curse, that's why he's got a crown of thorns right there. He took the curse for you. He bore the sin for you. And when you put faith in him and what he did for you at the cross, faith, God put you in him. This is what the Bible teaches. This is Romans 6, we'll get to it. When God put you in him now, instead of him, his eyes in heaven, the eyes of the father, instead of him looking down here at your first birth in Adam, he looks at you here in Christ. So he sees something different. So you're standing now as righteous with God. This is your position. Your position is in Christ and your standing <coughs> right now is righteous. It's not based on what you did. Based on what he did. Okay, but now the word justification means that God says it's so. God declares you righteous. I mean, I, look, I don't really care what the devil says about you. I don't care what your neighbor says about you. Your mama, your daddy, I don't care what they say about you. I'm here to tell you what the Bible says God says about you. God says justify. It's important that you and I understand that. It's important that you and I believe that. All right. And so let's go ahead and transition to Romans 5, 12 through 15 as we talk about the basis of our justification. Wherefore, as by one man sin, because listen, this is kind of wordy and we're going to try to break it down. We might not even finish this this morning. I'm not going to try to keep you here all day. All right. But just bear with me as we go through and we try to dissect it. I, don't, I shouldn't have to say all this, but. I've always said that I wanted to try to teach people the Bible in such a way that when they start reading it, they understand it for themselves. And it took me a long time to get there myself, so I know that we're, this is a process, right? It's a work in progress. All right. Wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. It might be easier for us to say it like this. Even before the law came, sin was already in the world, right? All right. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Imputed. Same word that we used with Abraham and David talking about putting into the account of. So even though the law wasn't here yet, okay, before the law came, sin was still in the world. But there wasn't like a law that allowed people to know exactly what God perceived as sin and what not. So he wasn't necessarily putting it in people's account and holding it against them that way. However, the result of sin was still the same as we're going to continue to read. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. In other words, the effect of sin was still in play. The result of sin, the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is spiritual and physical death. And even before the law came, people were dying because they received sin from Adam, right? But God wasn't necessarily holding it in an account, showing them that they were guilty, and at least in his own mind, because they themselves didn't know exactly how God felt about particular things. Does that, does that make sense? Kind of what I'm saying? All right. It says, uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Similitude. Who is the figure of him that was to come. Now, that's an interesting thing that Adam in this text is being spoken of as a figure, a type, a forerunner of Jesus. But not as the offense 
so also is the free gift. Again, a little bit confusing in the older language, so let me just try to help you out a little bit there. It's kind of like saying that the offense and the gift are similar, but they're definitely not the same. They're similar in the effect that they had on the human race, but the effect that they had on the human race was completely different. All right, and we're going to get into that. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. You know, there was a movie. I was, I'm kind of like researching, you know, stuff, trying to figure out ways I can better illustrate things. Because, you know, I'm like, Lord, help me be a better communicator because I can sit up here and say a lot of stuff. But if you don't really understand what I'm saying, then I'm kind of like really not communicating. And so my, my point number one was guilty by association. So I started Googling guilty by. Well, come to find out there was a movie that was made off of a true story called Guilty by Association. Now, I've never seen the movie. If you've seen the movie and you really liked it, just forgive me. I read the plot. OK, the plot behind the movie is that there's a young lady and she has children. And based upon previous decisions that she made in her life, it caused some some stress and some problems. And so now the story goes that she finds her a new boyfriend and she falls in love with this old boy. All right. And but she doesn't understand, doesn't realize that he's dealing drugs on the side. She doesn't know that. Maybe there's some clues, but you know, hey, she's lonely and she, she wants to fall in love with this guy. All right, well, when she does realize that he's dealing drugs on the slick, she kind of freaks out and she wants to get away. Well, so she attempts to get away, but before she does, they raid the house. And when they raided the house, they found the stuff. And when they found the stuff, she was arrested, guilty by association. That's point number one, but wait, it gets worse. In 1986, there was a law that talked about mandatory sentencing. So depending upon what the crime was, there was a mandatory sentence that had to be doled out. I don't know. Like I said, I only read the plot and it didn't explain it. If it had to do with the amount of drugs that were found, I don't really know. But she was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Somebody said, this is not a feel-good movie. If you want to feel good, don't watch the movie. She honestly did not know. I mean, really, to the extent that what happened. She was guilty. By, so she was with the wrong people at the wrong time in the wrong situation. Right? And so she was, once again, she was guilty by association. And that was my first point. Let's go back and look at Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Sin and death passed upon all men because of the sin of the one man named Adam. In the beginning, when Adam and Eve fell, God had explained in advance that the result of disobedience was going to result in death. But at that point in time, it wasn't explained exactly what all that entailed. And what I'm trying to say is God's always been progressive in the way that he reveals his knowledge. Here a little, there a little, you know, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. It wasn't explained that Adam would be the father of humanity. They didn't know that at that point in time. It was just written, if you disobey, you're going to die. So to speak, in other words, all humans born would be born of Adam, except Jesus Christ. Jesus was born of the Father, incorruptible seed, born of the Virgin. Every other single human being that's ever walked the face of the earth was born of Adam, comes from him. He is the father of their physical birth. There was another movie, I'm not going to say the name of it, but I thought that this was cool. Well, I'm going to say it was Chronicles of Narnia. I didn't like the overall movie because it just, I don't know. It just didn't like it. But they did say this one thing back then that was pretty profound. This is Adam's race. He's there. This one is one of Adam's race. And I've, since that time, I've read multiple behind multiple scholars and commentators. And that's how it's worded. Adam's race. We were Adam is our physical father in our physical birth. We come forth from him. We got we come forth from his loins. He's the federal head of humanity. He is he is our father in our physical birth. And from him, we received sin. From him, we received death. The whole human race is born already a sinner, guilty by association. We are guilty by our association with Adam. The text is clear that we've all sinned. <clears throat> Every one of us in this room understand that. We all know that we have, but the idea is that we sin because we were born sinners. And 
I'm going to try to break this down a little bit more for you in a second. But you got to understand, when you gush forth in water from your mother's womb, you already had that unsavory DNA embedded on the inside of you. Spiritual DNA, if you will. You were already born with a sinful nature. You sin because you're a sinner. I used to love, and I know I say it a lot, and I apologize, but whatever Brother Larson would say, if you think that sin isn't bound up in the heart of a child, you put two 18 monthers in the same crib, not even 18 months, you put two nine months, just barely even stand up and give one rubber ducky, and you see what happens. Something's, there's contention, strife. I want to touch my ducky. You know? And the same thing goes for adults. We got envy, we got jealousy. I got, I want what you got. And, and, but what, what I want you to know is, is that it's embedded in us. So when we get closer to Romans 6, we're going to discuss the daily impact of the sinful nature on our life. But right now, let it suffice to say that when we were born in our physical birth, we received the sinful nature. It's really, if you could say it this way, the factory that produces sin in us. We were born sinners, therefore we sin. Let me explain it another way. I thought this was such a good Analogy when I read this behind a, a particular commentator one time. He used to work at Moody Bible College. His name was uh, Warren Wearsby. He talked about the concept of angels versus humans. Man, this is good, I think. Because, see, a lot of times we complain about the fact, wait, hold on a second. Adam's the one that sinned. Now I'm being, I'm going to pay for it. I'm way ahead of myself in my notes, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now. If God gave us each our personal little garden, every last one of us would have failed the same way that Adam and Eve failed. Let's just go ahead and get that straight out in front. Don't be sitting here thinking more highly of ourselves and thinking, well, that's not fair that I fell into the sin because of the sin of Adam. No, hold on a second. You're going to be grateful that God allowed it to happen that way because at the same time, God allowed salvation to happen that way. But the angels are something different. We don't know exactly how it all went down, but I can tell you this, that it appears from the scriptures, I do know this, that the angels were here long before this earth that we know was here. I know that because the serpent is the enemy and he was in the garden waiting for the opportunity to bring deception. So we can imagine that on one day God said, I mean, because what we look at is the what we're told about is the creation and the days of creation based upon the world that we live on and know. But in some ages past, God created the angelic beings, celestial beings that he created. The difference between angels and humans on one sense is, is that angels were created at one time. Human beings have been multiplying through thousands of years of human history. And we were multiplying being born from our father Adam with sin already in the in, inside of us. Angels, on the other hand, were all created without sin. It says that about Satan. It says that when you were formed, you, it talks about, I'm paraphrasing, you were beautiful. There was no sin found in you until that day when you tried to lift yourself up above the throne of God. All the angels in heaven were created in a similar fashion and all the angels in heaven sinned. In a similar fashion. Yes, they're guilty by association of associating themselves with Satan, but they themselves had no sin in them and they made a choice to go towards that. And so they sinned in the similitude of Satan. Not every human being has sinned in the similitude of Adam because Adam was created without sin. Adam took a first step and made the first transgression. And because of that, each and every human being that has ever been born has already been born a sinner. Yes, we make our own decisions afterwards to commit sin. But that original act of sin by Adam, it's not the same similitude. It's not identical in what it was that God, that, that God is trying to say. So each one, uh, humans on the other hand, once again, were born into a sinful state because of their birth in Adam. Now, hopefully that makes some sense. To me, that was so profound when I first read that, I just thought it was so, so good, so meaningful, at least for me. Maybe it's a little too deep or, you know, maybe you don't think that way. But the human race, so different than the angelic creation. That's why there's no salvation for angels. Angels can't be redeemed. Angels beheld with their celestial eyes the glory of God, yet they still rebelled against God. You and I have never seen the glory of God. And we're asked to believe by faith in this plan of redemption. Amen. The angels marveled over salvation. 
There's a scripture, I believe it's in Hebrews, where it says they look into it. And I've said this to y'all before. It's almost like at this edge of this altar was the precipice of heaven. They peer over into looking at this thing called salvation. They don't understand it. They're mar they marvel at it. They're amazed by it. Because all they know is, is that a group of their compadres who once they ran with, I mean, I'm saying it that loosely, once they communed with, they were fellowshiped with, they were with one another, they served God together, made a decision one day, and then it was done. And they look down at the human race, and they see the mercy, and they see the grace that God has provided in Christ. And they're just, they're just sitting here watching these videos take place, and they're completely amazed at what it is that they see. I want to get at least to point number two. The wages of sin is death. So, so point number one is uh, guilty by association. Point number two, the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 13 through 14. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. You really and truly have already really preached point number two, uh, the wages of sin is death. Because I really wanted to break down the similitude of Adam's sin. I've already explained that to you. And I've also uh, talked about um, the fact of uh, sin is not imputed. I already, I already broke that down, right? The imputed means to be placed into the account of. And we, and, we, and we talked about the fact that uh, God said when he created, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 14 says this, Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. And even though the people before the law didn't sin exactly like Adam. Remember, I'm going back to where we were before. There was a period of time before the law came into existence where death was still reigning in their lives. They sinned. They died. Even though they did not, even though God wasn't keeping a direct tally of each sin, the result of sin was still was still death, right? And they and even though they hadn't sinned exactly like Adam. Humans, on the other hand, so the angels were different in the sense that they were without sin and they all chose individually to sin. Humans, on the other hand, experienced the death wage of sin, even though they don't sin exactly the same way that Adam did. And really, I have preached number two, so I think we're going to get done with this morning's message. Some may say, well, that's not fair, but point number three is the good news, righteous by association. Guilty by association, the wage of sin is death, but the good news is that we're righteous by association. Romans 5, 15. But not as the fence, so also is the free gift. Once again, just to explain it a little bit different, the offense and the gift are kind of the same, but they're not. They both had an effect on humanity, but a different effect. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. To start the breakdown of this scripture, I'd like to take a statement out of the previous verse. Had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now, I have already think I've already explained it, but who is him that was to come? Jesus. Jesus. So in this text, him that was to come is Jesus. So once again, I've said it already. Adam was a, was a foreshadow or a type of Jesus that was to come. He was the head of humanity. Right. And he is the father of the physical birth. And with his one act of sin, it resulted in death for the entirety of the human race. Guilty by association. But Jesus's one act of obedience resulted in righteousness and life for the whole human race. 
So before we say that it's not fair being born a sinner because of Adam, because if he made, uh, I, get, I already preached this to you, if he made a personal garden, we'd each fall, right? We would fall too. The good news is, is that even though we're guilty by association because of the one man Adam's sin, God's also allowed the plan of redemption to take place. Where because of the one righteous act of the obedient one, Jesus, he now can save all those that will put their faith in Christ. That's a whole lot of words that I used this morning, but essentially it goes back to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. You were born guilty. God sent righteousness from heaven. Righteousness from heaven was obedient and paid the death wage when he died on the cross. The exchange took place. He bore your guilt and a transference of his righteousness was given to you. And now based upon that transaction, God looks at you as though you had never sinned because he looks at Jesus, the righteous one. What a beautiful plan that God allowed all of that to happen for us. Amen. Amen. It allows us to be born again. That's what it says in John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I've shared this with you before. I was preaching one time, already starting to understand the message of the cross. And the next thing you know, I was preaching about being born again. And for the first time in my life, I got a revelation of it. The first time I was born of Adam in sin, my second birth in Christ is a spiritual birth. John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's a physical birth. There's a spiritual birth. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In your new birth in Christ, the old is done away with, and the new is resurrected to newness of life. And so I'll end today's message like this. So how does all this affect me today? Well, this is what I wrote. Each and every one of us in this room has done bad things. We were born of Adam in sin, but we've all, because of that, committed acts of sin and continue to do so. Hopefully we're not committing the same acts that we were committing however long ago, but we're still falling short of the grace of God. The word sin means to miss the mark. It's kind of like if you had a bullseye and you were an archer and this is the mark and you're shooting somewhere over here or you're shooting somewhere over here or over here. It don't matter how far away from the mark you are. You miss the mark. Sin is missing the mark of God. God and his righteousness. When you do it the way Jesus wouldn't do it. Sometimes we don't even know how Jesus would do it. That's why we got to know the word. And allow the Holy Spirit with the word to reveal to us that which is right versus wrong. Look, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked, Jeremiah said. Who can know it? Sin is bound up in the heart of man. Their motives are wrong. Intentions are wrong. I was listening to Lord just yesterday when I was working out. And he was like, you don't even know what's going on in your life. You, you, you sit there and think just because you got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost that you all right and pure? Oh, hold on a second. The enemy is constantly trying to put motives in our heart, impure thoughts in our heart, constantly trying to address those situations that draw us away from the Lord. The point that I'm trying to make is this. We all fall short. What ends up happening though, Satan wants to use the bad things that we've done and that we do to cause us to feel guilty and unworthy of God. It's his attempt to make us hide from the presence and the word of God. Just like he did to Adam and Eve, he wants to cause us to hide from the word and from his presence. But you've been given a gift from God. Ultimately, that's what justification results in. It says in verse 17, we didn't have time to get into that, that the gift is righteousness. And you've been given a gift from Jesus. I said this a while back that, you know what? God gave us a gift, Jesus, and Jesus gave us a gift, his righteousness. You've been given the gift of righteousness, which helps you today when you're facing the trials of life because you have access to grace. I mean, if you can imagine it like a psychologist that gives you a pill that you take every day and he tells you that this is going to make you better. No, the grace of God is going to make you better. It's a medicine for your soul. I had a conversation with somebody a while back and I thought that this was pretty profound. They were like, well, 
is it because we don't give in to sin as much that we're, we end up being different than the world? You know, I just felt like the Lord said, no, it's because you're taking medicine for your soul. You're in Christ now. You're in a new environment. You're in the sphere of grace. As the word of God is entered into your heart and on a daily basis, you continue to walk this out. The word of God with my spirit working in you is like medicine for your soul. It's healing you. It's changing the way that you see. It's changing the way that you think. And you're responding differently to circumstances and situations. Amen. You've been given the gift of righteousness which helped you today when you're facing the trials because you have access to grace. That's how it affects you today. That's why you got to know all this. I've seen people before. I need to shut up because I'm going over. But I've seen people before I'm like, Lord, dude, what is he even talking about? Well, if you hang around long enough, you're going to start to realize what we're talking about. Amen. Justification by faith is essential that you know it. So that when the devil starts lying to you, ho! Oh, Plead the blood of Jesus. He's my defense. He, he, I'm his servant. Who are you going to call guilty, liar? You're the one that's guilty. You're trying to make me guilty. You're the one that's guilty, Satan. Okay, and then one day, because of that gift of righteousness, you will experience the gift of eternal life. What a beautiful day. One day the trial is going to be over, folks. I'm telling you right now, the pain is going to be over. They ain't going to shed no more tears. Amen? Amen. The pain's going to be gone. But until that day, you can be rest assured that no matter what you're going through. Oh, I know. Oh, it feels right right now, preacher. <laughs> but what am I going to do tomorrow? Well, we're going to keep on holding on and keep on trusting the Lord. Don't think you're the only one that walks out of here feeling good. <laughs> Amen? And feeling like you're on, on fire for the Lord. Amen? And, and, and the, Because this is the truth. This ain't got nothing to do with the preacher up here. He's just trying to, he's just giving you the truth. And the truth of the gospel feels right to the true Christian heart. When they hear it, they're, they're, this, their spirit's bearing witness with the spirit of God that this is the truth of the word and hallelujah. But guess what? Here come the trial. Here comes the situation. Here comes the issue that you're dealing with. But you still have access to grace. So sometimes when you're feeling down, sometimes when you're feeling beat up, and you don't know what else, just keep on holding on, keep on trusting, amen, that Jesus paid the price for you to have access to grace.